Let me begin with a question for you guys. What is the key to successful shepherding? What is the key to successful shepherding? And by successful shepherding, I mean loving Christ's sheep the way that Christ desires them loved. And in the New Testament, no doubt the bar of love is very high in Scripture. So we read of the Apostle Paul uh, speaking to the church, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 2, like a father does his very children, like a nursing mother does her very own newborn. So I love you, Paul says. Paul is the model of loving Christ's sheep the way that Christ desires them loved. So then the question for us, many of us in our first five years of ministry, the question then is what enables us to love like Paul even stronger? What guarantees successful shepherding? In short, for the truly God-called pastor, the key to loving the sheep is loving their Savior. The key to loving the sheep is loving their Savior. Uh, now, this is not cutting edge at all. It is very basic. But if you are like me, you know that in your first five years of ministry, and certainly into the next five years, and Lord willing, until you die, we all make many blunders in the basic. Thus, we need reminders of what is basic. Let's look first and see that Christ requires His under-shepherds love Him. Christ requires His under-shepherds love Him. Uh, this love for God, no doubt, is to mark every single Christian. We can just think of uh, the greatest commandment, the summary of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But this love of God must be possessed especially by you, the pastor. This point is made clear when Jesus reinstates Peter in John 21. Go ahead and turn there with me now, John 21, verses 15 to 19. And in this tender conversation, the resurrected Christ charges Peter, who had just denied him and left him hanging, literally. And yet, Christ, aware of all of Peter's faults and sins, nevertheless lifts him up in due time and charges him. If you look there, if you're scanning those verses in 15, 16, and 17, he charges him, feed my sheep. Now, some of you may have been called into ministry because of these very verses in Christ's very charge. We embrace this charge. Many of us go to seminary in preparation to fulfill Jesus' charge, to fill, feed my sheep. And so we strive to become pastor theologians, familiar in the original languages. Sometimes we even approach formal theological education as if it were the essential requirement for ministry. But it isn't. So look at what Jesus asks of Peter before charging him there in 15, 16, 17. It is not, Peter, how big and vast is your storehouse of theological knowledge? That's not the essential requirement. And it isn't even, Peter, do you love the sheep? That's something we would expect because Jesus goes on to charge him, Peter, feed my sheep. But that too is not the essential requirement. No, the essential requirement is love for Christ, which is why he says before the charge, Peter, do you love me? For us to successfully love the sheep, we must love their shepherd. If Christ is going to charge a man to shepherd a sheep, Christ must be his love supreme. This is priority number one for Jesus. If Jesus is going to charge a man to shepherd a sheep, Christ must be his love supreme. That's point number one. Point number two, this supreme love for Christ is what brings forth a love for his sheep. This supreme love for Christ is what brings forth a love for his sheep. That's point number two. Andrew Fuller the late 18th century Baptist pastor said, if we love Christ, we will love His people for His sake. If we love Christ, we will love His people for His sake. And what Fuller was communicating was that in loving Christ, we come to love the very things that Christ Himself loves. In loving Christ, His desires and delights become our desires and delights. And we know this from everyday experience. Take human love, for example. So take my love for my wife, Melanie. So growing up, I could not stand reading. Couldn't stand it. There were places to explore, trails to be read and touchdowns to be made. But then something, something changed at age 25, unfortunately, very late in life. Enter in Melanie, godly woman, and I loved getting to know her. You know, we'd talk about favorite movies, and there I could drone on. 
We talk about uh, her favorite books, and she certainly would do all the talking because I didn't read hardly anything except for spark notes. But Melanie's favorite book of the time was this science fiction novel called Ender's Game. It's about how this little boy saves the world. And being smitten by Melanie and wanting to know her and know what made her tick, what made this woman tick, I went out, friends, and bought the book. Not only did I buy the book, but I read the book and enjoyed the book because Melanie enjoyed the book. In loving her, I then entered into her love. And that's exactly what happens in our love for Christ and indeed Christ's love for us. In our loving Him, the object of His love, in this case here, the church, the object of His love becomes the object of our love and the manner of His love becomes the manner of our love. And the more, by God's grace, the more and more our souls are transformed into the image of Christ, the more we begin to look like the Savior the more we are controlled and captivated by His love. And I think this is what the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul was about. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, he says, the love of Christ compels us, constrains us, controls us. And Jesus desires to entrust His sheep to men controlled by His love. That steward in the Lord's house will love the Lord. That steward in the Lord's house will love his house and his law and then go on to see that the Lord's people go and do the same. So who better, right? Who better to serve as doorman in the Lord's house than a man controlled by the Lord's love? When Christ is your love supreme, you will love his sheep in the way that he desires them loved. That's point number two. Loving Christ produces love for His people. So how does this play out in your ministries, our ministries, loving Christ and loving His people for His sake? I think it could play out a number of different ways, but I want to think particularly about the ways it plays out when we embrace His purposes for the church, His means to build the church, and then the manner in which He loves the church. So let's take purposes. Loving Christ's sheep the way that He wants them loved means that God's purposes for the church must be our purposes for the church. And we certainly know that God purposes that Christ would be the church's foundation and indeed the church's cornerstone and the church's end, as it says in Ephesians 5.26. So let's think about Christ's purposes in sanctification for the church. In sanctification, Christ readies the church for uh, Himself. The church is His beautiful bride. And as He goes about doing this with infinite wisdom and infinite knowledge, it produces something way beyond high precision timing. So He sets about sanctifying the church effectively, patiently, and lovingly. So He sanctifies His bride. Now, what if we go about trying to sanctify the church strictly according to our own timing, letting our purposes drive our service to His people. And we probably do this more than we realize, and we can tell by our attitudes towards the church, particularly when the people that you're shepherding don't want to follow your leadership. I mean, how did you react the last time your plans for your church didn't go the way that you wanted? Were you anxious? Did you despair? Did you get angry? Did you want to control or tyrannize or run away and avoid in fear? And in the face of opposition, haven't you ever, right, like just for one moment, seen the very sheep that God has entrusted to your care as obstacles to your grand church plan so that the sheep are no longer sheep to be tended to, but gravel in your shoe to be kicked aside so you can go about your own renovation plan? Friends, you know that in those moments, our ultimate problem is not with the people. It's with God. It's with God and His plan to sanctify His people. And, and His plan lags behind your plan. So God is on the clock. Tick tock, God. And in those sinful moments, we are mere servants trying to rule the Lord's house, even feeling threatened by God and threatened by God's people. But only pretend kings who think they own their kingdom feel threatened by the true king 
and his plans for his people. And that's our Nebuchadnezzar-like streak in us. Is this not great First Baptist, which I have built for my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Friends, if this is you, frustrated at the pace of change, pace of sanctification, uh, wanting even to clear out the sheepfold and fill them with new ones, friends, stop idolizing the idea of a healthy church and get on loving like Christ. I remember calling Jonathan Lehman a handful of years ago to share some of my frustrations and the things that I was going through at the time, and he just lovingly told me, he said, brother, stop idolizing the health of the church. See, I excelled, excelled at loving the idea of a healthy church, but failed to love God's people as they moved towards that health. I loved the end, but struggled to walk with God's people towards His appointed end. And if you think about that, that's just so incredibly God, ungodly. I mean, when God plans to take His people to His appointed end, He shepherds us along the way. And he sends his son to, to become the same stuff as us so that we might be walked with. He even gives us a spirit to dwell in us until he comes again. And at every single step of the way, whether he is reclaiming or rehabilitating, he never sees us as gravel in his shoe, but instead dear children to be raised to maturity. And as Psalm 149 verse 4 says, he delights over his people. Friends, stop idolizing the health of the church and just get on loving like Christ, guided by His purposes for His people. Let your love for Christ work its way out by embracing His purposes for His church, walking with the people in their sanctification. That's purposes. Now let's look at means here. Loving Christ's people for His sake means using His appointed means to accomplish His purposes. So we're looking at means here to accomplish His purposes. And the means by which the church is grounded on Christ and readied for Christ is the very word of Christ as Christ washes his bride with the word. Thus, Christ's under shepherds are to preach the word in season and out. He calls us to rightly handle the word. He calls us to guard the good deposit. This is the best food, so to speak. In fact, it is the only food by which those in his house are nourished to life. Now, if the Word of God is, is His appointed means to build up the church and to bind up His people, then it is negligent at best to disregard it. Think about this on your, in your own life. I mean, what would happen if the babysitter tossed out your instructions on how your kids are to thrive? What if she tossed out, he tossed out your allergy warnings that prevent death? What if they even tossed out your love letters that reaffirm and pledge your love to your children even while you're not there? Well, just as a good parent knows exactly what his child needs, so God knows the needs of his people. He knows what ails them. He knows what they hunger after, even if they themselves can't exactly identify it at the time. And he answers all of these hunger pangs in his good gospel. Thus, we need to use the appointed means. We need to preach the Word of God. The Master Chef has already prepared for His people life-giving food, and so now we need to serve it up, friends. Many of our people have been feasting on the world's poison. As you, I'm sure, know, if you've come out to Christianity later on in life, you feed on the world's poison. You've gotten so used to the meat and the buttered bread of this metaphorical Egypt and as God's process of weaning us from the world and to Himself oftentimes is hard, as we all know, God wants His people reminded and convinced every single Sunday, every Lord's Day, that the Lord is better and He is worthy. Some people come in on Sundays heavy-hearted. Just think of congregants, members of your own church. They come in heavy-hearted having given in again just a few hours before, to sin. They feel almost asphyxiated by their sin being ever before them in the guilt and in the shame. And they wonder, is there anything, something that I can do to just get right with God? And being brought to the end of their own strength, 
they wonder if they are actually under the wrath of God. In these moments, Pastor, God has given you the responsibility and the tools to recalibrate heaven's homing beacon in their very hearts through the preaching of the Word of God. Every single Lord's Day, recalibrating heaven's homing beacon in their hearts so they might long after the stuff that really satisfies. To those who feel that their sin is ever before them, you are to tell them, brother, yes, your sin is ever before you. But do you realize that your sin is ever before God too? Not in a way that brings condemnation because He doesn't desire to exact retribution for your sins. No, He catalogs them. His, your sins are ever before Him because He undertakes all of your debts, all of your sins, past, present, and future, and then He goes into the infinite resources of His own bank, comes out with them, and goes all in until His Son's blood is let out. Colossians 2.14 reads, He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You are to tell them, look, you are right. You can't do anything to get right with God. Which is why God has already made Christ to be all you need to get right with him. He's already made him to be your justification, your righteousness, and indeed your sanctification, as it says in 1 Corinthians 1.30 to Christians feeling that they've been abandoned by their Father, that God has abandoned them to condemnation. We tell them from 1 Thessalonians 5, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation, not through your own works, friends, but through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. So we say... Brother, do you see? Do you see what kind of love the Father has given to you too? That we should be called the children of God and that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord who died on the cross as a substitutionary, wrath-bearing atonement for our very sins. And that is done objectively. Friends, this is the word. This is the appointed means by which God sends out to accomplish his very plans. Therefore, wield it in your pulpit and wield it in your interpersonal ministry so that your people would sing, even if just one decibel louder than yesterday. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you see, friends, for every possible affliction there is, there is every possible consolation in the gospel. Christ has already provided the pasture of the gospel, and it's our responsibility to lead his sheep into it. If you love Christ, you will love his people for his sake by using his appointed means to see his purposes accomplished. Lastly, if we love Christ's people for his sake, we'll love his sheep in his same manner. We will love his sheep in his same manner. Jesus said in John 10, verse 11, that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And I love here the reflection that you get in, in the Apostle Paul when he writes in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. The problem is, though, if we know our own love, we know that so often we love only when it's convenient. We know that our love is impatient. We get frustrated. We are selfish, and our love is, frankly, fickle. And this, too, is so unchristlike. I mean, Christ's love is so committed. It is so zealous for his own glory, which includes that he's zealous over his people finding their satisfaction in Him, finding their own joy in Him. And ju just imagine, right, as Christ's love is committed, as Christ's love is zealous, so Christ's love is eager. Eager to give of His life, expend of Himself for the very rescue of sinners. I mean, can you imagine Him eagerly waiting on the edge of salvation history for the fullness of time to arrive, and then when the time comes... 
when the time comes for him to leave his, the throne of glory, when the time comes for him to traverse the universe, for him to take on flesh the very form of a servant born in the likeness of men so that he would minister to men, he eagerly goes to the cross. His love is not fickle. It never wavers. He didn't turn to the left or to the right, but he set his face like a stone to the cross. So just as he enters into our situation in order to identify, in order to love, so we pastors are called to do the same, to have a committed love, a zealous love, an eager love, awaiting for the fruit of the Spirit to, to give birth to wonderful things in their lives. We are to give ourselves to loving the sheep, seeking to know them in order that we might identify with them, that we might know their wounds, the sheep's wounds, and how they got them, knowing the contours of their scars and observing how they regularly wear them. We are to learn what makes them limp and what makes them bound. We are to learn what makes them despair and what strengthens their hearts and hope. And in doing so, we have the opportunity to minister the gospel effectively in their lives. It's imperative that we do this, brothers. For be reminded, there is indeed one who observes with malicious intent, with the goal to exploit, furthering the purposes of the kingdom of darkness. But we, as Christ's stewards, we seek to know and love so that God would have his way with his people, binding them up in the gospel and bringing them home through the power of the gospel. Knowing our people allows us to minister Christ's truth with both precision and content, and precision in manner, so that our speech will be full of grace in the pulpit and in interpersonal ministry, whether we are admonishing, whether we are encouraging, whether we are helping the weak. If you were like me, we know that we fall so woefully short in loving others in the same manner that Christ loves his sheep. But friends, even in those moments, even in our failures, even though we're crying out for more grace to help us love his people, thank God it is not our love that our people rely on, depend on, but it is indeed the love of the one and only true shepherd. And as we strive to love the church as Christ loves them, we need to remind his people of his great love for them. Brothers, love Christ's sheep. Not ultimately in a way that we think they should be loved, not even a way that they think they should be loved, but in a way where they know is love because it is Christ-like. What a wonderful opportunity we have charged by the master of the house to stand at his door to welcome his adopted children into his house to see others find shelter in him through the preaching of his word and do so in a manner resembling Christ himself. Friends, do you desire a successful ministry as defined by loving Christ's sheep the way he desires them loved? Then see to it that your supreme love is Christ himself because in loving Christ, you will love his people for his sake. Before Christ charges a man to feed his sheep, he wants to know of your love for him. And one thing guarantees that you'll love Jesus' sheep the way he wants them loved. That's loving the one who died for them and, friends, who died for you too. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would see that Christ would be exalted in our own lives, in the lives of all of our people. Lord, we pray now that you would give us a large capacity to love like Christ. We pray, Lord, that this would mean that we herald the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is that that the people feed on and we ourselves feed on. Lord, teach us ourselves to be happy and joyful in the Lord to the praise of your glorious grace. In your name we pray, amen.